Division One is now in session. Please We're here in our case one C A C B seventeen dash zero one eight zero Bell and sixty three versus Isle Owner. Each side will have twenty minutes to present their uh, argument appellant. You may you know, reserve any uh, time that you want for a rebuttal, but you'll have to Keep track of the time yourself. The clock at the podium for for that uh, 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 purpose. We are recording the argument, and in a couple of days here, the argument will be uh, will be available on uh, YouTube. Because we're we're recording it, please identify your client and yourself when you begin your uh, argument so we can keep everything straight. We've read the record and the briefs in, in this case. We've conferenced the case, so we're familiar with the facts and the law and the argument. So when you begin your argument, just start writing on what you want us to know. Counsel, you may begin. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Allison Chase. I'm with the law firm of Keller Roback, and I represent the plaintiffs' appellants, Bell and 63rd Investments, LLC, and George B.N. Wilner. A representative of my clients is here today in the courtroom. Um, I will try to reserve some time to rebuttal. The trial court's dis disposition of this case entailed the following. First, summary adjudication of plaintiff's claim for loss of rent on grounds raised by defendant Appley Auto Owners Insurance Company for the first time in a reply brief and based on out-of-state authority. Second, summary adjudication of plaintiff's claim concerning a stolen refrigerator, again on grounds raised for the first time in a reply brief and grounds which were directly and entirely contradictory to the argument advanced by auto owners itself in its opening brief on summary judgment. Third, sua sponte summary adjudication of the remainder of plaintiff's claims and on grounds not raised by auto owners and without pl affording plaintiffs either notice or a reasonable opportunity to respond. In sum, as relevant to this appeal, the action was resolved in its entirety on the basis of grounds that the plaintiffs were never given an opportunity to address in writing, either due to a sub sua sponte summary adjudication or because the winning arguments, such as they were, were raised by auto owners for the first time in substantially overlength reply briefs. I would note, moreover, that the nuanced reply arguments had not been disclosed in the litigation as required by Rule 26 of our Rules of Civil Procedure. This action did have a somewhat unique litigation history and some amount of acrimony, but the issues to be decided in this appeal are, for the most part, pure and very clear, clear questions of law. That is, questions relating to whether the trial court adhered to bedrock principles of the rules of civil procedure, straightforward issues of contractual interpretation, and whether the trial court adhered to the text of ARS 12-34101 in deciding to award fees. You, begin, you mentioned the reply brief issue. Didn't the, these arguments also appear, or, or they were also raised in a response to your motion for summary judgment? It wasn't just a reply, so you had an opportunity to reply to their response to the summary judgment motion. No, we just cross-moved on for summary judgment on this on grounds only raised in um, the opening briefs on summary judgment, and we did not have a written reply brief. In fact, just to clarify this a little bit, auto owners' reply briefs, I believe it was a Monday morning hearing, we got those reply briefs with the new arguments on a Friday evening. When we showed up to the Monday morning hearing, and this is reflected in, I believe, the May 9th of 2016 transcript, 
we asked um, the trial court if we could just have a little more time to digest the arguments that we'd received that Friday night, because they were like 15 to 20 page reply briefs that had a substantial amount of new material. So we got them, I think, you know, the Friday before the Monday hearing. So, and, and asking a very specific question. So, okay. was it a, re a reply and response to your cross motion for summary judgment? Yes. Okay. But and we did not have a subsequent not reply brief. to file a reply because it came so late before the hearing. Exactly. But you did have an opportunity to address them at the hearing on the motion for summary judgment. We had only the new arguments that were in the reply brief, and I think that's the stolen refrigerator contractual interpretation, I'm sorry, the stolen refrigerator contractual interpretation argument and the, um, the loss of rent new argument. We had a chance to address them orally at the hearing, but we did not have a chance to address those in writing or present. Yeah. Well, motions for reconsideration later in which you address them. But the um, no, didn't. we didn't move for reconsideration on the reply brief arguments. We moved for reconsideration on um, the sua sponte summary adjudication of the bad faith claim. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, returning to the Rule 56 issue. Um, auto owners did not seek summary judgment with respect to the claim for insurance bad faith or the entirety of the breach of contract claim. The motion was limited as relevant to this appeal to loss of rent, coverage for the refrigerator, and punitive damages. Counsel, what was the base of loss of rent? What was the basis of the request for loss of rent? Um, in the moving opening papers, let me make sure I have this correct. Um, the basis was that the prop in the initial summary judgment motion, it was that the, pro that the premises were not rendered, quote unquote, unfit to live in by the vandalism incident, and I think it was May of 2014. So was the renter put out by virtue of these damages that you wanted auto owners to cover? Um, the rent, the tenant had, I think, vacated. It was a May incident. The tenant had vacated in April, um, just a couple weeks before the vandalism. Then what rents were lost? Um, our argument is that there was a history of normal rents for this property. It had an established rental history, um, renting, I think, at 2800 a month. Generally, there was a tenant. They had not had long periods of vacancy. As a factual question, there was a, quote, unquote, history of normal rents for the property. Now, to just move forward a little, a little, that distinguishes this property from the case, the Nesler case, which the trial court looked to. That was the new on reply out-of-state Georgia case that the trial court relied on for the notion that there had to be a lease in place in order to have a loss of rent. But in that case, you actually had no history of rental income. There was no normal rent to be lost. Um, I believe, to just quote the case, the property was purchased in April of 2013 and less than a month later in May of 2013 was vandalized. So there was no quote unquote normal rent in the Nesler case. That's just one factor distinguishing that case. We also don't believe that was correctly decided. And I can discuss that in more. So, so the loss of rent then is rather speculative because you have no, and it's just going to say in the record that you had a tenant ready to uh, move in who couldn't move in. Well, they were in the process of just cleaning it up between rentals. Um, you know, after a tenant moves out, and I think he moved out in late April, the prior tenant, the landlord was just in the process of getting it, you know, getting it cleaned up, making sure the paint was fresh before putting it on the market again to seek a new tenant. Um, and I think that's where this California case Ventura Kessler is very helpful because it contains language that explains why, you know, if you've lost normal, if you have a rental history, it's not unusual to expect if you're a property owner that even if there's not a tenant right at the time of a vandalism or a covered loss, that there still might be a loss of rent. To quote that case, it says, quote, rental property is often vacant between tenants. It was reasonable for the policyholder to expect that the policy covered loss rent and did not depend on the fortuity of having a tenant in place when the damage occurred. So if you have a history of rental, you have some basis to calculate, quote, unquote, normal rent. And the clause, the relevant clause in the policy states, if a covered loss makes the described premises unfit to live in, we will pay for your loss of normal rents resulting from such covered loss while the described premises is unfit to live in. Now, maybe that's only a month that it takes to get it fixed up. Maybe it's three months. There's limitations in the policy which um, limit the loss of rent coverage to only $20,000. So I think this, the trial court erred by saying, well, unless you have a tenant, you could string out your loss and try to claim a huge loss. But that's not really possible here. And that analysis was erroneous because 
there's a limitation in the policy of $20,000. And secondly, it only applies for the amount of time required to make it, quote, unquote, fit to live in again, the time to do the repairs. Um, so, so Council, just so I'm clear on the, on the flip side of the coin you just offered us, uh, you say there's a history of rental. Mm -hmm. Is there a history of non-rental? For instance, if, if, you're, if you're saying that we had a renter in for two years, and so that two years is period of rental, then it sat vacant, vacant for six months or it sat vacant for a year, do you have any indication of how long it was owned and how long it was rented as opposed to how long it sat waiting for a renter? You know, I don't know that that was in the record. And I, I cannot recall anything in the record as to the history of the history prior to the tenant. So we really don't know which one is the more dominant period, the rental or the non-rental period. And, you know, these would have been wonderful questions to have actually ventilated in the litigation. But this Nesler case was never, or this notion that it, there was no loss of rent, that wasn't the... That wasn't a disclosed defense, and so it wasn't ventilated in the litigation. That was something, I, th I agree, that's something that could have been, you know, we could have had expert evidence, maybe we could have had additional discovery on that, but because this Nesler case was never disclosed as one of the grounds for defense, that never got ventilated. We got this new in a reply brief um, on summary judgment. This could have been raised, and I think the trial court did note this in his um, his order on fees, this could have been raised, this defense could have been raised, and auto owners could have moved for summary judgment on the basis of this, this defense years prior to when they did if they wanted to raise it. It was very late, and we didn't have the opportunity to present evidence at the summary judgment phase on it, and we didn't even have the opportunity to uh, really uh, ventilate these issues in litigation through discovery or expert work or anything like that, like you would expect. So that's why I think you're finding that there is a little bit of a deficit in the record on this question of normal rents. What we have is there was a tenant, there was a established rental rate. Thank you. Um, I'm going to then turn back to, sorry, I'm going to actually jump ahead to the refrigerator issue. Um, the refrigerator was stolen. Auto owner's motion argued that the refrigerator was not covered under the policy at issue because it was not a fixture. Auto owner's motion for summary judgment argued, quote, refrigerator is personal property and not a fixture, end quote. Auto owner's motion went on to cite various definitions of fixture, such as Merriam-Webster's definition for a fixture. It continued to argue, quote, that a fixture is also defined as something that is fixed or attached. Even if a stolen refrigerator was connected to a water line, it would not qualify as a fixture except close quote, et cetera, so on and so forth. They clearly employed a fixtures based analysis. And again, that was the basis on which the litigation had proceeded and discovery had gone and depositions were taken. Um, given that the auto owner's motion for summary ju judgment focused on whether refri the refrigerator at issue was a fixture, plaintiffs responded to the MSJ by arguing, yes, it was a fixture. We looked to Arizona law on the three-part test of Fish versus Valley National Bank and said under Arizona law and under the record as we have it, it's a fixture. In the reply brief, auto owners took a different tack, but it's an understatement to say that it was just a different tack. They expressly contradicted the argument advanced in the opening brief. Auto owners said, quote, the common law fixture test does not apply, end quote. Again, in this court, auto owners argues, quote, the Superior Court correctly determined the common law fixture analysis did not apply, end quote. In other words, the reply brief not only abandoned the initial fixture argument advanced by auto owners, it expressly contradicted it. Um, and I would like to say that I think that's not okay. And I don't know whether you want to term it as fundamental fairness, fair play, judicial estoppel, or litigation estoppel. A party shouldn't be able to advance in an argument, and once their adversary has disproven or met that argument, say, wait a minute, we have a totally different one, which we're going to contradict ourselves. Um, now, the new one replying contradictory policy construction argument was in any event incorrect, and the trial court should, certainly should not have adopted this new one reply argument. And I think it's helpful to look at the text of the Superior Court's ruling. The Superior Court said, quote, the personal property portion of the policy, the end of coverage C, says we do cover your appliances and household furnishings, and that part of the described premises regularly rented or held out for rental to others by the insured. The clear implication of that is that the appliances and furnishings are covered as personal property. What both the described premises definition and the covered property description refer to the building. The coverage refers to structures. When you put that together with the coverage for personal property, 
Appliances are not covered unless they're part of the covered structure. So his ruling was that appliances are personal. In other words, is that appliances would qualify as personal property if they constitute, quote unquote, part of the covered structure. As an initial matter, we would argue that the record supported that the refrigerator at issue was part of the covered structure, or in the very least, there was a factual dispute, which wasn't appropriate for resolution on summary judgment. Well, I, I, I don't understand how a refrigerator that's plugged into the wall and possibly connected to a water line, if it's a fancy one, is a part of the st structure uh, of a house. Well, I think consider that it is plumbed into the water line that if you look at the photos of what happened it had to be cut out um, to be removed from the house in any event if we're applying we don't we do as a plaintiff's appellants do not agree that quote unquote part of the covered structure was the correct interpretation um, but in any event I think that's a that's a fact question whether you want to say that it constitutes part of the covered structure now, your client purchased uh, coverage for personal property? He did not pur purchase the personal property coverage. So if a, a refrigerator is personal property, then it's not covered. The problem is, is that the very, and the reason we look to the fixtures test, and I think auto owners look to the fixtures test, is that it determines when an item of personal property has become so incorporated into real property as to be part of it. I think that that is fundamentally, quote unquote, part of the covered structure, which the trial court said, and that we're getting into a bit of a circular argument here on the construction issue. But as to whether it was, quote unquote, part of the covered structure, I think you look at the nature of the connection, and I think then there's a fact issue about whether or not that was sufficient to constitute, quote unquote, part of this covered structure. And in looking at the fixtures analysis, which I think is useful as an analytic matter, Attachment is the least important, and Arizona law is clear on this, attachment is the least important of the three elements of that test. And it's particularly so when you're talking about something here such as a rental. In the cases that we cited to the trial court said that refrigerators, especially when you're talking about a rental and then they're installed, can constitute part of the covered structure. Also, I would note, in terms of the course of performance, what happened here, a microwave and a refrigerator were also covered as part of the structure. A microwave, you could say, I can go to Home Depot and buy a they microwave. They never conceded coverage. They just said, we'll pay for these two. They, they changed their position on that. Um, initially, they said that it was covered because um, it was built into the cabinetry, and so it was part of the covered structure. Then later on, and I think you see in the record that there was that initial offer of coverage and that coverage. Um, then that payment didn't actually get made, and there was like that seven-month interregnum where there was, hey, I haven't gotten paid. No, you've been paid. didn't get made because he refused to accept it. Well, he refused the advance. Okay. And then when he came back, he refused an advance, which was $700. He accepted the fuller payment of $17,000. And then he said, wait a minute, you forgot the amount that you, dis you deducted for the advance. Um, I didn't take that, so you got to add that back in to the $17,000. And they gave him an extra 1000 too, right? The no, it was because of the double application of the deductible. So okay. that, okay. you see, got it. It sounds like your time is running short. Are there other issues you'd like to cover? I would like to just say one or two words on 340-101. The plain text of 340-101 says that any fee award that it cannot exceed the amount, quote, paid or agreed to be paid, end quote. And here's the fundamental thing that we don't know. How much did auto owners pay its counsel for the representation? What was submitted in support of the fee account fee application was just raw billing entries. And I think if you have any experience with law firm billing, you know that the raw entries are neither the amount that necessarily goes out to the client or that the client pays back. That's because in the exercise of billing judgment, it's common to write off time. The client objects to time or doesn't agree to pay for time. So you have to know how much was actually paid. That raw data doesn't fill in the portion that is absolutely necessary for 340-101 in order for there to be a fee award. Um, and I would also like to point out something else about this. We raised this because um, there obviously was the defective declaration issue. That declaration got signed um, by counsel for the defendants, but they never fixed that. They never told us how much was actually paid by auto owners for this representation. Um, and the second thing is that we did seek discovery on this point, and we were, um, auto owners refused to, or I should say, counsel for auto owners refused to provide any information of the amount that was actually paid or agreed to be paid. 
Um, unless you have any questions on that point, I'll reserve the rest. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, let me fine. Let me ask you a question real quickly. Auto owners refused to provide any information, and yet their submission was $500,000? So are you saying that they put a chunk in and refused it? to delineate it, or are you saying that there was an additional sum above the $500,000 that they refused to disclose? Okay. Um, the records submitted in support of the fee application were kind of basically the raw billing entries. They weren't the invoices that went to the client, and there wasn't any information about how much was actually paid, like the line, like the end amount, after discounts, after write-offs, that sort of thing. What we sought discovery of from Defense Counsel was the amount that they had actually received in payment, and we were never given that. We also raised these issues in our opposition to the fee request, and we just have never been told how much was paid. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, I'll the rest. Thank you. Counsel? May it please the court. Good morning. My name is Kevin Barrett, and along with my colleague Melissa England, we represent Auto Owners Insurance Company, who's the appellee and cross appellant. Um, I'd like to start off the argument by talking about only something that was raised briefly by counsel in their oral argument is the, the sua sponte bad faith ruling, because I think that's the one that is probably the most interesting on appeal. I, I think we could agree on a couple of things. One, that the court has the inherent power to grant sua sponte summary judgment. And I think we can also agree that the role of this court is to, one, look at things de novo and affirm the trial court if there's any basis in the record upon which it can be affirmed. I think if you look at the record on this case, the bad faith claim was fully fleshed out by counsel. Um, if, if, if you look initially at the summary judgment motion that was filed by auto owners, they filed a claim against the punitive damages claim. And under insurance law, in order to be entitled to punitive damages, because it's a tort damage remedy, there has to be the tort of bad faith that's committed. Auto owners and its moving papers laid out the claims history and said there's no basis for any finding that auto owners engaged in anything that was unfair or improper or could rise to the level of an evil mind that would require or allow the imposition of punitive damages. In opposition, the appellants took an interesting position. They said, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're going to prove that there's bad, that there's punitive damages should be allowed here. And we're going to prove that by bringing forth our best evidence of their bad faith conduct. And in opposition to the motion, they brought in an additional Make sure I have the number right. I think it's about 67, 68 additional facts on top of the undisputed facts that auto owners had brought forth in its motion. And between the facts that auto owners brought forth regarding the claims handling and regarding and considering the additional facts that the appellants brought forth, everything about the bad faith claim was in the record. Everything that they wanted to bring forth to say, look how bad auto owners acted. Look at the bad faith here. Hey, Counsel, is part of that bad faith your representation? Yes, Your Honor. One of the claims in this case, um, after uh, Mr. Ben Wilner had gone out to auto owners and, and there was a, an incident when he went to pick up his check where he was um, asked to leave the premises and had threatened litigation, my office was retained to represent auto owners with respect to that threatened litigation. Auto owners through my office reached out to the appellants and said, what's the issue with your claim? Mr. Ben Wilner refused to communicate with auto owners counsel. Instead, for months and months, well, after the initial communication, he wanted to report me to the state bar and allegedly. And, and, and this, is, this is kind of the area I want to go into, but he wanted to represent you to the state bar because you were representing them? Yes. So he, you're... you're, you're your inappropriate conduct was simply that you took them as a client? Uh, he, if I understand his argument correctly, felt that there was nothing in the policy that required him to talk to auto owners' attorney. He was entitled to talk to auto owners directly. Even though he had threatened litigation and auto owners had hired bad faith defense counsel who reached out to, at that 
point the appellant, Mr. Ben Wilner, and said, hey, what's this case about? What's going on? Um, refused to communicate. And you'll see in the record, and I believe uh, it's the exhibits to the motion for summary judgment, there's a, a, a long pattern of Mr. Ben Wilner refusing to communicate with counsel. He wanted to talk to the branch manager. He wrote to the vice president of auto owners. He wrote a letter to the CEO of auto owners. And then he wrote a letter to all the board of the directors of auto owners demanding that he be satisfied, that he be made whole. How did this impact auto owners costs? When we, we, we've addressed the 12341 issue. My question is, what percentage are we talking about of increase over what would have been incurred otherwise? Well, if you look at the entirety of the litigation, it increased it quite a bit. Uh, once discovery got started, and if you'll, you'll note in the record, there's a long period of time even after the complaint is filed where anything happens. The case, I believe, was actually put on the dismissal calendar before, a, uh, 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 before it got going. Um, uh, the, the, the first thing that they wanted to do was take the deposition of auto owner's counsel. They wanted to take my deposition. That was the, the first thing out of the gate that they wanted to do for discovery. Um, uh, we had argued to the court, and the court correctly ruled that uh, I'm counsel for auto owners. I'm not a, a party. I don't have any information. But this strategy of attempting to disqualify auto owner's counsel permeates everything that auto owners had to do to defend the case through the end. Even at the very end at trial, Appellants were working to try to disqualify trial counsel as a tactic. Kind of a scorched earth approach. I mean, is that what we're looking at? I don't understand it. So that's why I'm asking to well, clarify it. Well, yes. And, and if we want to talk about the fee issue, that's, I don't disagree that a heck of a lot of money was spent defending this case. But if you look at the tactics that appellants engaged in, it was reasonable and necessary. Auto owners had to maintain uh, additional counsel just in case their preferred trial counsel, for some reason, somehow got disqualified on a trial tactic basis. You'll also note that there was extensive motion practice with respect to discovery disputes. Um, uh, there were, uh, we, auto owners had to file a protective order to stop the appellants from deposing the CEO of auto owners and the vice president of auto owners and their secretary because the tactic they took was to demand those depositions. Um, there were additional depositions. I think there were 17 depositions taken in this case. 11 of them were, were noticed by plaintiff. Many of them were, were peripheral witnesses. But, and even some of the depositions of the main witnesses, the claims adjusters, those went over four hours. Um, it, it was a, a tactics that were designed uh, as a scorched earth and bordered on abusive. I mean, the, the, the court was repeatedly called upon to review matters for discovery. And, and essentially, not to, to be flip about their, their arguments, but I think their argument was, well, we don't believe auto owners disclosed everything on their computers. So judge, we think they should bring your computers in and you look through every screen to make sure we got what we were supposed to get. Can you respond briefly to counsel's argument uh, at the end of her uh, discussion regarding whether or not you have met the requirement under 341 to show the amount actually paid. Yeah, it, well, my short answer is that's, that's form over substance, and it doesn't really matter for a couple reasons. One, I'm not so sure that there's a requirement that the affidavit be done under the penalty of perjury, for one. Two, it was fixed through a notice of errata, errata that added a couple things. Um, so I've, I, I heard her making a slightly different argument than the one I had garnered from her brief, which is not the penalty of perjury issue so much as whether you met the other requirement, which yeah. is that the amount be actually amounts incurred, not incurred, but actually paid. I think if, well, I think the rule is it's a paid or agreed to pay. I think that's the standard. And if you look at the initial declaration that was filed, it's in the record at 303. Um, it's my declaration, paragraph one. Uh, this is a declaration based on my review of the invoices sent to auto owners. If you look at paragraph four, it's a recitation of my hourly rate charged to auto owners. And then there's additional paragraphs about the other uh, professionals that worked on the case. If you look at paragraph 12, auto owners agreed to pay the following hourly billing rates for the attorneys, excuse me, billing rates for services performed by its attorneys and paralegals in this matter. They agreed to pay. I'm not, I've never understood 
the other than the, the idea about the penalty of perjury, the substantive argument that a declaration signed by counsel that lays out, they hired me, this is the rate I charged them, this is a complete list of all the billing entries I sent them that they agreed to pay, that that's somehow deficient because the canceled checks weren't provided. Counsel, I don't want to know your hourly rate. I may get embarrassed if I heard your hourly rate. I don't know. But my question is, is it your normal hourly rate? Um, it's lower than my normal hourly rate because, uh, I, I, frankly, I do a lot of work for auto owners, and so I have a rate that I would charge for litigation for a one-off client that I charge a reduced rate because I do uh, a number of matters for auto owners. So this isn't, and I'm just pulling this out of the air, but this isn't a case where the client came in and said, look, you charge us as much as you can possibly charge us because we're going to win this thing and we're going to gouge them. No, and uh, that's something that I would like to bring up because as, as uh, at least a, a, an appellant on the cross issue with respect to the fees, I think the trial court abused its discretion on how it addressed the fee issue. And there's two things that are at play here. One is the entitlement to fees, and then the second is the determination of the fees. And I think the trial court abused its discretion because it mixed the two. We all understand that it's a, a associated indemnity versus Warner that determines whether the court's going to grant fees. And you have that seven-part test about what they look at in terms of the novelty and, and, and the skill and, and all those things. The court engaged in that analysis and determined auto owners was the prevailing party and it was entitled to its attorney's fees. I mean, they, they beat an offer of judgment and they were the prevailing party on a matter arising out of contract. So the court said, we're going to give you your fees. But that's when the court's supposed to pivot, and it's a different analysis as to the amount of the fees. The amount of the fees is determined by China Doll. So what happened is, is the court took factors with respect to the entitlement to fees and mixed them in with its determination of how much the fee should be. Under China Doll, there's really only two factors. One, the rate, and there's been no challenge that the rate here is improper. And two, whether an attorney would have reasonably engaged in the activity that they did to defend the interests of their insured. What the trial court judge did is said, look, I looked at the, their offer of judgment or settlement at 29 something, $30,000, and your offer of judgment in 10. That was done early on. Under, in, my opinion is, is that you could have settled for 30 grand. You chose not to. Therefore, my determination is that any fees that you incurred after that, I'm not gonna give you. Now, the judge was, in, was obligated to give us our expert fees and it was and it gave us an amount of fees at about eighty thousand dollars what it thought we could have paid to settle plus the fees that were incurred up until that time that is fundamentally an abuse of the court's discretion because and for one of the reasons that you raised is that it doesn't give it doesn't look at the individual activities of of auto owners attorneys to make sure they were reasonable and necessary and prudent at the time didn't the court's finding go beyond that didn't they find that some of the actions not just the decision not to settle but some of the litigation that you guys engaged in was was unreasonable the court did mention that but i'm not so sure that's supported by the record i mean in terms of for example, there was, I mentioned, I think there was four or five different motions to compel, to compel that were filed by plaintiff, most of which garnered almost nothing in terms of additional materials and certainly stuff that wasn't in the record or before the court when the substantive issues were decided. You know, auto owners um, defended itself as best it could against aggressive scorched earth tactics. I, I, don't, I, I don't see anywhere in the record where you could point to a particular document and said this was unreasonable. You shouldn't you shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have filed this. Auto owners was mostly reactive in this case because it, it spent most of its time parrying one motion after another. So and I and I want to take a step back and say the court didn't analyze some of the things that you said by maybe saying, well, look, this activity I think was unreasonable. That's what it's obligated to do under China Doll. It didn't say, well, you shouldn't have filed this motion because no reasonable or prudent attorney would do this to advance its client's interests. Or conversely, they might have said, well, yeah, this activity was something that needed to be done, but it took too many hours. And I know, you know, there's there's some back and forth in, in the briefs about the amount of time spent, but I think if you look at the totality of the hours spent, 
and what we, we were on the eve of trial before the, the, the cases were decided. The fact that, you know, I can't remember now, actually I lost the train of thought, it was 22, 23, whatever, 100 hours it was that added up to this 500, you look at it from, from 30,000 feet, it does seem like quite a lot. But when you get down to the day-to-day -day litigation. Yeah, 10,000 feet, it still looks like quite a lot. <laughs> look, it, it looks like a lot sitting at that table sometimes, too. <laughs> that you, but when you look at the day-to-day -day activities, essentially what, under the trial court's ruling, I'm not entitled to, or auto owners is not entitled to win as its prevailing party fee the amount it took to get the protective order to stop the deposition of its CEO because that happened after the mediation. It happened after the time auto owners could have settled. And that's the problem with the court's analysis and fundamentally the, the abuse uh, of discretion is that Let's hypothetically say the court, the, the, the case goes back down. We're going to, I don't know exactly what we do, allow them to oppose the court's MSJ on bad faith or whatever, but auto owners is entitled to any fees for defending that motion because, hey, you could have settled two years ago. And that's the, that's why the standard is, is this what a reasonable and prudent attorney would have done on each individual action? Not just, well, I think this case cost a lot and you could have settled earlier. That's just wrong. Can we change, or something I'm kind of curious about is, and I don't know that it has legal significance, but why was there the shift in litigation posture tactics that uh, counsel complained about? In other words, why did you take position A, argue fixture, 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 and then switch to position B? Well, I have property. And, and similarly, why did some of these things on the rent only show up in a response to a motion for summary judgment and or reply to? I think that there are two answers to that. One, I don't think counsel is accurately characterizing the opening briefs of, of the parties. I mean, auto owner's position has always been is that this is not covered. And you yourself noted that, at least with respect to the, um, uh, the, the contract claims, the refrigerator and the, uh, uh, and the lost rents, it was a, a motion cross motion for summary judgment and opposition. We filed an opposition in reply. And I do want to note that I found it a little odd that, that appellants are sort of art making this argument that they were denied the opportunity to respond. One of the things that we fought pretty hard at at the trial court level is that the cross motion was late. What happened was is that after the deadline had passed and on the eve of trial, they're filing a brand new cross motion bringing in dozens and dozens of new facts. And again, to, to your point, counsel was, was arguing, well, it would have been nice to flesh out those facts. Hey, they filed for cross motion for summary judgment on the same issue. If they had additional facts, they were free to bring them in. They didn't. And that's getting back to the, the fundamental fairness of it all. I don't think these arguments that, that they're talking about, particularly the Nestler case, I, I, don't, I, I think that was raised in an opposition to their motion. But notably, your review is de novo. The, the technical part of, well, maybe you, 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 the, the judge shouldn't have considered that argument. It's in the record. What the judge ruled is somewhat irrelevant to your analysis. You look at the record and decide. And the Nessler case is 100% on point. It's auto owners. It's auto owners policy. And the language of the, of the policy itself requires that they will pay for lost rent for that portion of the building that isn't rented. Now, look, I can read you the rented part, I think, is the language. Yeah, I'd like, I want to read the exact language because memorizing policy language is not my strong suit. Um, For an insurance defense lawyer, that could be problematic. Yeah, but I want to memorize it because if you're wrong, it, it could could really matter. But if, if you look at the language again for the, for the coverage, we will pay this loss of normal rents only for the shortest time needed to make the rented part fit to live in, the rented part. Notably, in appellant's cross motion on this issue, they argued, well, we need to have a, 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 a factual determination as to how long they were entitled to lost rents. As the, you guys probably understand, an, uh, an insurance policy is there to indemnify for losses. If you don't have a renter, you don't have losses. If you don't have a rented part, you're not losing anything. It's it's speculative at best, and I mean the, the court has already identified this question of how often it's going to be um, 
rented or not rented. I, I think the fact that there's no renter is dispositive in and of itself. Uh, I'm coming close to the end of my time. So I think the only other thing I might want to address is, I'll address the refrigerator quickly. I think that their argument is somewhat of a red herring. The policy provides coverage for personal property if you buy it. Appellant chose not to buy it. The evidence shows that this is, is personal property. Their uh, appellant himself said that they move refrigerators in and out of the property all the time. When we tried to get a, a receipt from him to show, hey, you, you say you replaced the refrigerator. Can we have the receipt for the one that you replaced? Ah, I don't have that. We have lots of refrigerators. We move them in and out all the time. Move them in, all, in and out all the time means it's personal property. The, I, I think the fixture analysis is somewhat of a non-issue because the policy here controls. There's no need to go to the common law. The policy said what personal property was is appliances. He didn't buy that coverage. The idea that somehow there's a, there's a, a way to attach the water fixture in such a way that makes it so uh, part of the building, I, I don't think that should go into play. And I'll say that on one last issue, it's almost like no good deed goes unpunished. The insurance company gave Mr. Ben Wilner, the benefit of the doubt with respect to the stove and microwave and paid him for it because he claimed that they were built into the property. Later turned out that that wasn't necessarily true, but they ended up saying, look, we said we would pay you for it, we'll pay you for it, but that's, they, they weren't covered because they were attached. Thank you, Tim, for your time and up. Thank you. Everything with respect to bad faith was not in the record. Um, Rawlings versus Apodec, just because auto owners moved for summary judgment on punitive damages doesn't mean that that also incorporated a motion for summary judgment on the underlying bad faith case. I think it's very clear in Rawlings versus Apodaca that in order to obtain punitive damages, there has to be, quote unquote, something more, which is a quote unquote evil mind. It's a different element that's required for punitives. They only moved on that, and so in response, which was a one-page argument by auto owners, we just offered the evidence from which a quote-unquote evil mind we thought could be inferred. And that was only a limited category of evidence going to the specific intent requirements for punitive damages on insurance bad faith. So it was a limited motion on a particular issue. We responded on that. Now, could we have put forward in our entire case on bad faith in response to the request for punitives? Yes, but that wasn't required. It's a fact-intensive issue. We responded on the specific issue. Um, now I'd like to talk briefly about the fees. China Doll was not a 34101 case. It was a case about a contractual fee shifting provision, and what the court said specifically was that it was outlining the requirements for affidavits. It wasn't setting forth um, any sort of restriction on the trial court's authority um, in setting 34101 fee awards. And I would note that Associated Indemnity makes clear that there is broad trial court discretion to set a fee award. There was no abuse of discretion here, and I think if you look at the trial court's order, it clearly complied with associated indemnity, which is the governing authority. Thank, Thank you, Tantha. We appreciate your, your uh, uh, argument. We appreciate the argument of both counsel. We'll take this matter under uh, advisement and issue a decision in due course. We stand adjourned.